Hi guys, how are you doing? I wanted to talk briefly about emotivism. It's an idea in philosophy that things can either be expressed as good or bad. So in a nutshell, it's very difficult or impossible to say whether a moral action is empirically good or empirically bad. Instead, what emotivism suggests is that people have a response to it which is either positive or negative. The media are playing on a very basic emotivist response which people have when they read certain things they either think that someone is good or someone is bad based on very little information such as a headline and I think the media are manipulating people. The media have been playing on this for a long time. Anne Widdicombe is being attacked in the news for saying that maybe scientists will find a cure for homosexuality. Don't get me wrong this was a very stupid thing for her to say and even in context, this is still pretty stupid. Uh, I mean, you can watch the clip yourself. Maybe I'll even risk putting it here. You suggested that the unhappy set homosexual should, according to gay activists, be denied <laughs> any chance whatsoever to investigate any possibility of seeing if he can be helped to become heterosexual. Now, I don't even need to ask you whether or not that's still your view. The fact that you expressed it means that plenty of people would not want to share a platform with you. And I also pointed out that there was a time when we thought it was quite impossible for men to become women and vice versa. I realise what she's trying to do here. She's trying to say, look, in the olden days things were different, essentially. But I, I don't think... This is a false equivalency. And the fact that we now think it is quite impossible uh, for people to switch sexuality doesn't mean that science may not yet produce an answer at some stage. That was the thrust of... No, just, I'm just going to be clear, you are no, saying that... Okay, so that's probably the line that they're all talking about. Science will find a cure for homosexuality. That would imply that um, there's something wrong with you know being homosexual for a start, which again probably rubs people up the wrong way. To be honest, as a senior politician, she should probably know better, and I know she's kind of expressed similar views in the past. I think the media's changed a lot, you know. It seems a lot more aggressive, it seems to attack people a lot more, and it will take one little thing that they say and it will take it out of context and then make it into a sensational story. I guess at the end of the day, um, news media is in the business of selling stories. So this is kind of what they're doing. But I'm going possibility to finish. That science I don't that know. We can change sexuality. I don't know any more than people once knew whether it was possible for men to become women. Mm. I don't know and I've never claimed, and this is where I'm misrepresented quite mm. often. And she could have just said, I don't know from the start and then she you know, none of this controversy would have actually happened. The basic start of science is the phrase, I don't know. I've never claimed that such science already exists. I've never claimed that. I've merely said that if you simply rule out the possibility of it, you're denying people who are confused about their sexuality or, or discontented with it, the chances that you do give to people who want to change gender. And that's all I've said. I do Maybe one day we'll all live on the moon. You know, that's a possibility, it's certainly within the realms of science, but again, I think this was just a stupid thing that she said. Um, when you consider this woman who, you know, obviously she's been an MP for a very long time for the Conservatives, now she's running for Change UK, Carl Benjamin lost to her by a massive margin, I think he got about 3.6%, which is pretty awful, but I'm going to explain in the um, video why this might be the case. Do not imagine for one moment that the Brexit party will be putting forward a policy on gay sex changes in its manifesto. We have health, we have education. I suspect it will have we a have policy on equality office. though, we, won't you know, it? You know, you're just completely looking for things that actually do not determine people's votes. Now I do think her statements were very stupid and I don't agree in the least. But the media, yet again, took what she said and take, took it out of context to kind of create this yay boo moment. The reader of the media will think, hmm, she's one of the bad people, even if I only read the headline. And here's the thing, a lot of people will just read the headline and they will assume, well look, this woman does not agree with our politics and therefore she's one of the bad people. But the media are doing this to advance a certain narrative, and I don't know what it is, it seems to be the status quo at the moment. So why do people believe one thing and not another? I think it comes down to the number of times something has been encountered, and in what context. So 
let's use dogs as an example. If all the dogs you encounter seem friendly, you'll generally believe that they are friendly creatures. However, if all the dogs you encounter seem aggressive, then you'll think all dogs are aggressive. Now, more traumatic events have more of an impact, so one dog attack may be stronger than a hundred friendly encounters. And this can cause a lot of phobia, it can cause a lot of fear, it can change someone's attitude towards dogs for the rest of their life. So, for example, when the media starts saying things like, Nigel Farage is the most dangerous man in the United Kingdom, you know they're really trying to poison people against him, using this really primordial fear that, that we kind of have. They're um, saying that he's literally dangerous. So, for example, if the media were to print 10 positive stories about immigration, this would actually have the effect of making people more favourable towards immigration. Whereas if the media actually printed 10 negative stories about immigration, it would actually have the opposite effect. So what the media tend to do is when there's a big news event, right, they'll either choose to publicise it or they'll choose to not publicise it. And, well, they might, for example, run the story once um, and that will have a very small effect. But if they, for example, run the whole story over a week, uh, then it's going to have a much bigger impact on influencing the general public. And they know this, but this is part of the problem with social media, because on social media, you get caught in a sort of social media bubble, so then you start to get confirmation bias, right? Because if everyone in your bubble, for example, really likes dogs, then you're probably going to start to like dogs more. If everyone in your social media bubble hates dogs and thinks they're scary, then again, this can have an impact and change your opinion. And when you're talking about um, a country absolutely full of people, the number of times things appear in the media really matters. In a nutshell, what people want to know is, is this person in our tribe or are they the enemy? And if a person's in your tribe, what does that mean? Well, it means that they agree with your worldviews, that you can kind of understand their language and relate to them it kind of means that, to a certain extent, they represent you and what you think. And if they're not in your tribe, then perhaps you want to attack them. Perhaps you think they're bad people. Um, perhaps you think, well, you might start using words like traitor. This can happen across the political spectrum. Take the example of Cole Benjamin, aka Sargon of Akkad, a YouTuber who ran for the EU Parliament. The media attacked him relentlessly to the casual observer who would only read the headlines, they would think that this person was dangerous. The truth is, Sargon of Akkad is actually a great guy, and most of the general public would actually agree with nearly everything he says, if he was presented in an impartial way. The casual observer who would only read the headlines would have the instant reaction that this person isn't in our tribe. This isn't a person to be trusted. This isn't a person we should vote for. Most people really don't pay too much attention to politics. Let's say, for example, 50% of people have a passing interest. Maybe only 1 in 10 people would have a deep interest. So, in other words, 4 out of 10 people will probably just skim the surface of politics. They might only read the headline. They might engage only in a very superficial way to think, yay, this fits in with my beliefs, or boo, this does not fit in with my, with my beliefs. The media know this. They know that they can attack someone, and the attack will be effective, even if what they're saying isn't strictly true, an exaggeration, or even a plain lie. We're living in an age of information overload, unlike any other in our history. Adverts compete for a tiny sliver of our attention. If the media can get one idea into somebody's head that someone is bad and not a member of the tribe, then they've won if they're trying to smear someone. So how can we fight this? Well, maybe when we read something and have an, an immediate reaction to it, we should just not trust that reaction. And maybe we should look into it a little bit more deeply 
try to understand the context, try to understand maybe the author's bias if we're reading it, or try to understand the bias of the um, media institution. Why, why did they choose this story? You know, why did they put prominence on this? Are they trying to push a particular agenda or a particular idea? Who gains from it and who has a vested interest? Even smart, well-educated, otherwise tolerant people can start frothing at the mouth when they find an enemy who disagrees with them. And the social activist left are the worst at this. Just yesterday, I saw a tweet that said, if you're not fully up to date with what's happening in the trans community, then you're not welcome at Pride. Now, again, this is sort of saying that you need to have our beliefs. And if you don't share our beliefs, even if you're an otherwise what they would characterize as an ally, if you don't have the correct beliefs, then you're not welcome. You're an outsider. You're an enemy to be attacked. You're part of the problem. So for most of the past 200,000 years, which is roughly the time that human beings have been relatively modern, we've lived in tribes. Groups of up to 200 to 300 people Staying in the tribe can be the difference between life and death. People kicked out of the tribe may never have kids because no partner will want them. They may get killed off because a lone human is far weaker than a group. And they lose all the knowledge and resources of that group. In other words, humans have a deep, pathological fear of ostracism, of being kicked out of their tribe. This fear is worse than physical pain and it drives people to conform. Honestly, if you look at certain rituals that people go through, a lot of people will actually bear physical pain rather than being outside the tribe. People who associate with members of the enemy tribe are often seen as the enemy. So people are also smeared by their associations. So for example, many politicians on the right are compared to Hitler and fascists and the Nazis. And to be fair, some politicians on the left are compared with Stalinists or Communists, which is a smear designed to elicit fear response and the otherizing and demonizing of political opponents. Of course, this can happen anywhere in politics, but it's something we should avoid if possible because it damages healthy democracies. We should be open to all ideas, with less popular ideas not being implemented. This is why we need free and open representative democracies where people can express an opinion without being shouted down or attacked or have a milkshake thrown on them. Democracy means rule of the people. So you have people that represent certain groups within society, right? This is the basic idea of democracy. And if you start suppressing certain groups, that's not democracy anymore. It starts to become authoritarian. And look, people are not stupid. Just because someone hears an idea, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to believe in that idea. I know I said that people will hear frequent, will hear ideas frequently and they will adjust their opinions, but if you hear a stupid idea a thousand times, you're not going to start to believe in it just because you've heard it a thousand times. In fact, it will probably have the opposite reaction and you'll probably become immunized to that particular message. All we can do to fight this is to have genuinely open minds, to try and stay out of tribal thinking, and to try to pay attention to multiple sources of news, even those from other tribes. Thanks for listening. Just wanted to give you a massive thank you for watching. If you like the video, please subscribe. Um, give this a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, give it a thumbs down. It's up to you entirely. But uh, yeah, please uh, let me know in the comments what you thought, and thank you very much for watching. I just wanted to give you the actual definition of bigotry. Now, it is, according to Google, intolerance towards those who hold a different opinion from oneself. So that means that if you are intolerant of people who have different ideas, then you're a bigot. I hear this word thrown around a lot in general conversation. And, you know, I just wanted to point out that a lot of the people who accuse other people of being bigots because they hold the wrong beliefs of themselves being bigots and it's very hypocritical. Just wanted to point that out.